Welcome, everyone, to Think Like a Pancreas, the podcast, where our goal is to keep you informed, inspired, and a little entertained on all things diabetes. The information contained in the program is based on the experience and opinions of the Integrated Diabetes Services staff and their guest experts. And given the individualized nature of diabetes care, any changes to your treatment plan should be discussed with your healthcare provider. I'm your host, Gary Shiner, owner and clinical director of Integrated Diabetes Services. And today we're gonna to be discussing all things related to glucagon. And I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Michael Riddell. Mike is a professor of physiology at York University School of Kinesiology and Health Science in Toronto. He has more than 20 years of experience researching the impact of exercise and various hormones in diabetes management. Mike also lives with type 1 diabetes personally. I can't remember, how long have you had type 1, Mike? Well, hey, Gary. Um, it has been 38 years. 38 years. You and I were probably diagnosed very close. I was in the summer of 85. Yeah, I think that mine was the fall of 84 or 85. I always have to ask my mom because I forget. <laughs> okay, well, we might have been right around the same time. Uh, now, you, you put on, I saw in your bio online that you, you like to be called the diabetes agent of change. Does that mean that you're a spy for the Canadian government or what do you mean by that? Oh, that's a funny one. Well, first, Gary, I, I have to say that I am, it's a, just such a thrill to be on the show with you. You you and I have been friends for a long time and I've admired all your efforts in the field. I think you're more of an agent of change than me, but I think I tried to come up with something that let people know that I'm advocating and pushing for the evolution of technologies and, and therapies and type one diabetes. We can't just sit on our hands and use the same types of tools we did uh, you know, some 40 years ago when you and I were diagnosed. Yeah. You know, I've always admired two things about you. One is your hair. You have great hair. <laughs> the other is, you know, your passion and the research you've done in the field of exercise and type one diabetes, because there's not many people doing work in that area. And, it, and it's so needed. Now, you're the person that puts the evidence and the data behind of a lot of the things that I, I recommend to patients. So thank you for all you've done. So now turning to this topic of glucagon. In your life, have you ever required or used pers glucagon personally? I've been carrying glucagon for years and years and years and have never used it on myself or on my son with type 1. My mother-in-law, who has type 1, has been given glucagon a few times, but not by me. So it's something that I haven't had to use, but I've been so close several times. And I think that... Uh, I, I probably should have been given it in, in a few cases, but my wife has gotten me through with whatever was handy in the kitchen. Uh, it is something that I do fear, though, still, that that need of loss of, of, of glucagon because of loss of consciousness or severe hypo event. Sure. And just so everybody is on the same level of playing field, explain what glucagon is and how it actually works. Yeah, glucagon is, I guess, the anti-insulin hormone in our body. It is a critically important hormone that keeps our blood sugars up. If you don't have diabetes, glucagon will start to rise when your blood sugar drops below the normal concentration. And in the U.S., that, that might be around, you know, 70 milligrams per deciliter liter or so. Glucagon it may even go up a little bit more as the blood sugar drops after a meal. Those of us who live with type one diabetes, we have dysfunctional insulin. We don't make and secrete insulin normally, uh, maybe not at all. And glucagon is also a bit dysfunctional in type one diabetes. We just don't get a rise in glucagon when our sugars drop. So it's a, it's a rescue hormone. It's a counter regulatory hormone. It's also an exercise hormone. So when you exercise, glucagon is one of the key hormones to keep our sugars up. Um, and, and it's, a, it's a critical hormone for, for glucose homeostasis. And I understand that it, it's main, uh, locus of activity is at the liver. So it stimulates yeah. the liver to release its glucose stores into the bloodstream. Yes, and exactly. Fast, uh, to allow yeah. recovery. And one of the things I learned from the, the literature and from some of the re research we do here is because 
glucagon is normally dumped into the portal vein, which is a vein that then travels to the liver. The liver sees the glucagon first in, in, a, in a person who doesn't have diabetes and secretes it. And of course, uh, if, we don't, if we don't make glucagon and we take it with a pen or syringe, it takes a bit of time to get around to that liver, but you're right. It's the primary site of action. We also know that glucagon acts on fat cells to mobilize lipids as an energy source. There are glucagon receptors on fat cells, and it may be important, and again, an exercise to mobilizing our fat. So glucagon shares that with insulin. You know, right. Insulin normally is secreted into the portal circulation. Right. It's the liver first where it does a yeah. lot of its work. Whereas you know, the sub Q tissue we give insulin to, it takes a long time for it to reach the liver. Yeah, it's the same problem, isn't it? I wish it that is. we, and and you know, I think some people believe that we could maybe deliver insulin and glucagon into the interperitoneal space or into the closer to the liver, but it's challenging to do that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, getting needles that long and getting cannulas that long to go into that space yeah. would be tricky. Despite that, you know, non physiologic way of distributing it still works well, you know, when somebody it is does, having yeah. a severe low or is unable to you know, treat, the, recover from a low normally with food, it usually does work within, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes and re restores a person to a, at least a safe conscious level where they yeah, can. Yeah, absolutely. Eat. Yeah, absolutely. It works, it works pretty darn quickly. Um, and I think it's, it's such an important um, safety, I, I guess, element in our toolkit, but not everybody carries glucagon with them. I'm sure that all the patients you counsel, re you recommend that they have glucagon with them, but it's something we've seen uh, that people just aren't aware of. They're afraid to take it. They don't bother to fill the prescriptions. Do you have any thoughts on how we can get the message out that it's good to have? Well, I think that a big part of the problem is the legacy of the red box or orange box glucagon mm. kits, because mm -hmm. it's such a complex thing to administer. Yeah, it comes with a big, ugly looking needle and yeah. instructions with 36 easy to follow steps <laughs> in a exactly. crisis situation. It, it's a very difficult thing for someone to administer, particularly yeah. when you're not a healthcare provider and not used to using this kind of equipment. So for the, you know, for decades, I think people just lost faith in it and said, I can't use this in an emergency anyway. So what's the point? But right. glucagon has changed as far as how it's administered in recent years. You want to talk a little about that? Well, I, you're you're an expert on this, I think, as much or more than me. We, we now can recommend to patients that they carry a soluble form of glucagon. There's two companies that I'm aware of that have made glucagon that's kind of ready to use. It's already in its liquid form. And these, this just makes it easier and faster. You don't have to mix it. The needles are smaller. It, it, I think it has a longer shelf life, life um, once it's mixed, that's for sure. And maybe you can enlighten me on some of the other things that you've discovered because you have access to this in the US, but in Canada, we don't have the same access. So do you have any other things I'm missing, Gary, on how it's improved? Well, yeah, you, to reiterate, yeah, we do have two different companies making a ready to inject form of glucagon uh, with Zegalog and uh, Gvoke from Zeris Pharmaceutical. Uh, and with both of those, it comes in a pen form and the user simply has to pull off a cap, press it into the skin and hold it a few seconds and it's done. The user doesn't have to mix anything. They never even see a needle. They don't have to press any buttons. It, it's almost self-administers. So it's extremely easy for almost anyone to, to uh, give this in an emergency situation or to self-administer if the case arises. The other form of glucagon that we have in the States now uh, is called Baxime. It, it looks like a nasal spray. It, it is a nasal spray. It, it sprays glucagon in a mist form at a high speed into the nasal passages. It absorbs through the mucal lining of the nasal passage and gets into the circulation pretty quickly that way. Um, you know, there's some pros and cons to, to each version. Uh, the shelf life, like you said, is much better now. I know at least with the GVOC from Zeris, we got a two and a half year shelf life at room temperature. And this is what's printed on the package. We all know these things generally work pretty well even past the expiration dates. Uh, but it's nice to not have to worry about replacing it so frequently like we had to, used to have to do with the red box. Um, 
have you had any experience with the nasal or heard anything about the, the nasal spray, the Baxime? Yeah, that, that's a Canadian invention. So I'm proud to say that that is available in Canada and I, I know the inventors very well. Uh, so it's the one I carry on my backpack all the time. I have it in my backpack right now. But again, I have not used it yet. I haven't had the need to use it and I'd love to use it. Uh, I think on anybody who needs it, as soon as I uh, find a, a use case scenario, well, I'm on a CGM and a closed loop system. So my hypoglycemia has been minimized in the last several years, but I still worry that it might happen. And I, I do carry back Simi with me. Well, you make a great point. Now, I'm, I'm like you, I use a CGM, a hybrid closed loop system, um, but it has cut down on the incidence of hypoglycemia in most people. And the frequency is less, the severity is less, the duration is shorter, but it still happens. And yeah. severe lows can happen you know, in any instance to anybody, even if they're really well managed. So I, I, like, I, like you said, we encourage people to have this available and make sure a loved one uh, knows how to administer it and when to administer it. Um, I have not actually received a glucagon injection or spray in got to be 25 years. This is back wow. the days of NPH insulin when yeah. I was playing basketball most nights and the NPH would kick in in the middle of the night and make me go really low. Can you share me that story about basketball? Because you know I love playing basketball too. Yeah, I still play. Uh, yeah, just when you exercise late in the day, you become hypersensitive to your insulin for a while. And if you work out long enough and hard enough, you, know, you deplete your, your muscle glycogen stores, and that's going to cause your blood sugar to drop for hours after the workout's over. So those delayed drops uh, combined with that NPH insulin, yeah, you know, it, it's a, an accident waiting to happen. So yeah, absolutely. I had a couple of, of severe lows in the middle of the night. The first mm -hmm. time my wife called paramedics and the second mm -hmm. time she gave me glucagon, but didn't give it to me correctly. <laughs> Is that right? So that's what you hear. You know, it's so complicated back then when you had to mix it and, and administer it. Yeah. What happened? To, it was just the saline or? She mixed it and then yeah. she went to inject it. She sprayed most of it out before sticking the needle in my body. <laughs> uh, well, it, it does. Uh, make you wonder if sometimes it's an overdose anyway you probably still responded to it even though yeah. it wasn't a full dose yeah um so yeah you know, the one drawback i've heard with the vaccine compared to the others is that it can be painful yeah it's a really strong pressure that's shot into the nasal passage and i've had some parents also report that they had a hard time giving this to someone who's seizing. If they're having a seizure from their lung, right, it's right. difficult to hold them still long enough to get this into the nose. I see. Whereas the pens can be injected almost any place. Anywhere the in the body. body. Uh, even if someone, you find one part of their body, you can just hold it for a few seconds and, and it's done. But they all well, work. Well, you look more prepared than me because you've got three options in your space and I only have the <laughs> well, one option in my space. It's just because I teach this all the time. I like to show yeah. people the, I don't carry all three with me. I'm not, not that impulsive. <laughs> uh, so glucagon's always been considered that kind of last resort emergency treatment yeah. for a severe low. You know, somebody yes. is unconscious or unresponsive or belligerent and is not able or willing to take food or drink. So the glucagon is injected and that's the way to help them recover. But that's changed. You know, we have uh, other applications, if you will. What are some of the other ways glucagon can be, or situations where glucagon might be useful? Well, um, we know from kids camps that small doses of glucagon are used before kids lose consciousness. You know, they're active all the time. They're playing in their various camps, sports camps. And we've learned that a mini dose of glucagon, um, particularly if it's a soluble form of glucagon, can be used to help treat a mild low. Um, and in our research, we've been using it to prevent a low associated with exercise. We've done a couple clinical trials where we've used the uh, uh, 150 microgram dose, which is a mini dose about, I guess it's about one seventh or maybe one tenth a full treatment dose. And if you use that before exercise, you prevent hypoglycemia and you don't require carbohydrate feeding. So I was excited to be 
part of those studies, we did them up here in Canada. And I, I couldn't get my hands on the product myself because it was very carefully controlled mm -hmm. studies. Uh, but I, we did notice that the participants that were using it were having a high level of satisfaction because it just minimized hypoglycemia around exercise. It was a pretty simple and convenient tool. Five minutes before exercise, you take this little dose and you don't need any carbohydrate feeding. And the, the risk for hypoglycemia was just disappeared. So I think we're starting to wonder if it could be a preventative tool rather than just a, a rescue tool, if given in small doses. So in your research, what type of exercise were people performing where the glucagon was able to prevent a, a drop in their blood sugar? Well, the first study we did was treadmill, uh, brisk treadmill walking, and it was quite successful there. It's aerobic exercise. So the study participants were walking at a brisk pace um, for around 45 minutes, and it worked like a dream there. And then we moved into follow-up studies where they would do all sorts of different exercises at home. And we gave them the prescription. They got to take the, the uh, uh, glucagon with them. And we gave them some guidance on not to use it if their blood sugar was really high or if they're doing a, an interval workout or a sprint or resistance training, because we don't think we need glucagon administered for those. But for any aerobic exercise, walking, jogging, cycling, swimming, they could use it. And they had a high level of satisfaction. On average, they were using it two or three times a week for their aerobic workouts. And it seemed to work like a charm. Nice. Uh, so the, the 15 micrograms you mentioned, it, that's, that's the equivalent of about three units on an insulin syringe. Uh, the only version of glucagon I know of that we can use for these purposes uh, is made by Xeris. It's called the GVOC Hypo Kit. Instead of coming in a pre-filled pen where it's almost impossible to access the, 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 the drug, the, the glucagon comes in a vial. It's uh, about half the size of an insulin vial, very small vial. And you, know, you can draw out with an insulin syringe, you know, whatever dose you want to administer. Now the FDA has not approved it for that purpose. And I'm not aware of any government that's actually approved it for that use. No, not yet. It's considered you know, an off-label off -label. way of using glucagon. Have you ever encountered people who experience you know, negative side effects or any kind of harm from giving themselves glucagon? Well, first, let me say that's exactly what we did in our study. We used that GVOC um, uh, vial and, and instructed them how to pull that up in a syringe. And the, although the company could, could make a, a device that does this, it's just simple to do as exactly as you had mentioned. But, but that is off-label. And um, I don't know how long it'll take before we get it as a prescription. In our study, there was only a couple of instances of mild symptoms of nausea. No other, no other symptoms were collected in, in our study, which had several hundred exercise events, not that many participants, maybe 35 participants, but several hundred exercise events and only a couple cases of nausea. Uh, you can sometimes uh, get a local irritation or a burning sensation at the site, but I think we used to feel that with some insulin injections anyway, I guess maybe it's part of the formulation. Mm -hmm. But these are kind of minor symptoms. Uh, no one threw up, no one was in a lot of pain and it seemed to be f fairly well tolerated. Yeah, uh, so I, I tried it myself on several occasions and documented what the results were. Uh, I tried it with uh, a running workout. Uh, you know, it ran for about half an hour. It worked beautifully. Uh, I tried it during a weightlifting workout. It worked well, although like you said, with anaerobic forms of exercise, it often isn't even necessary to do that. But for me, because I work out after dinner most of the time, I did need it. So, you know, I took, I took my usual insulin dose at dinner. And if I hadn't taken the glucagon, I, I probably would have dropped. And, you know, several of our team members uh, on our clinical staff at Integrated Diabetes Services, we, we also, you know, I had several of our clinicians try it as well. And, you know, the experience was a very positive one. You know, we did learn that the dosage matters. I found that if we took more than say four or five units, it was too much. And it would also sting like a beast. It was, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a okay. very acidic uh, mixture. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and if we took less than two, it didn't seem to do much of anything. So that 
three units is kind of the sweet spot and that's what you used in your research so it's it is yeah but i i'm I'm um, interested in learning more about the insulin on board effect, because in our study, we didn't do a really good job of understanding if your insulin on board is high, if you need a bit more. So do you have any other pearls of uh, wisdom or knowledge on if your ILB is high? Only in theory. I know that if insulin levels are high, it'll impair the alpha cells from secreting glucagon. But I don't know if it impairs glucagon's action yeah, it does. The, yeah. The liver, the it does. Yeah, it does. So we are, I was kind of wondering if maybe you might need a bit more if IOB is high, but I guess we need to experiment a bit more on that. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be interesting to look at. Yeah. It, it's something you know, as a practice, uh, what are, because all of our clinicians have lived with type one, we, we experiment, you know, we try all yeah. the different meds that come out, even if they're not indicated for type two. Uh, all the devices. I'm getting an eyelet, bionic, bionic pancreas uh, today. Uh-huh. I'm going to be wearing for a while just to, to try it out. So, you know, we give people a chance to learn from our experience and help them decide what's what's going to be in their best interest. We don't have yeah, I think, to share. I, th- I think that's what makes your service so valuable to those of us who are living with type one. You You are living with that same condition and you're experimenting with all sorts of things. And we, that's what I admire most about, I think what you guys offer there. Yeah. Yeah. You find people in this field, clinicians who have type one or have that personal connection somehow Yeah, Yeah. uh, (laughs) kind of gets us to the next level in terms of what we're willing to try and what we can share with folks. Yes. And I think it's good because you also listen to some of the things that you're uh, that your clients are telling you and you you'll try them too to see if it passes the sniff test and often Absolutely. it does their exper- their lived experiences are as valuable as, as ours most of the time yeah. you know with, with that micro dosing it's it's feasible to use glucagon for treating just daily garden variety lows and yeah. we see value in that for people who are trying to lose weight because they yes. don't want to consume the extra calories you yes. even see parents who don't want to wake their kid or don't want to give them sugary food in the middle of the night because they're worried about rotting their teeth. Yes. There's all kinds of excuses people can come up with. But Yeah, I think there's also some evidence uh, that, that glucagon can have a satiety effect. So if you take glucagon, then you don't have as much hunger, really, mm. after exercise. And may, I wonder if that could be interesting to, to, to understand a bit, a bit more, we, not that we want to create disordered eating, but I think we often feel like we're over consuming calories because of our low blood sugars. Oh, and that can be very tell me about it. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know about the satiety effect from glucagon. That's interesting. Yeah, there are receptors in the brain for glucagon and it's, it acts very similar to the GLP-1 analogs, not as potent as a GLP-1 analog like Ozempic or, uh, our laraglutide, but but it does have a, a satiety effect. When we give it to our rodents in our research labs, they consume less uh, chow voluntarily. And so we've been wondering about the implications of long-term use, let's say of glucagon in a bionic pancreas. Would it, would it maybe change our food intake patterns and allow mm-hmm. us to lose weight more effectively? And we, we don't know for sure, but it's, it's, it's possibly there. It's possibly there. Yeah. I, I mean, I take pretty good care of my myself and my diabetes, but my my weak point is when I get low, I can't stop. Yeah, eating. me too. It's difficult. Yeah, it's extreme. You know, you we try to follow the guidelines of 15 grams, but you and I know that if you're low enough and you're frustrated enough, you'll consume maybe 200 calories easily. Yeah. I've done 200 grams of carb. Forget yeah, and calories. I, I'll add fat and protein to that if it's ice cream or if I can get my hands on something. So we, you and I know that listening to these recommendations from these healthcare experts is hard, is hard when you're high. Yeah. And I know if I have trouble and you have trouble, Everyone a lot of people that. have trouble with it. So yeah. we know what we're supposed to do. We've got the tools to do it, but it's, it's very hard to do. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Now you mentioned the dual hormone system. You know, that's another important application for, uh, I just call it liquid glucagon. Yeah. Explain a little bit about how that system would work. There's a few research uh, teams that have played around with this. There's a couple in the U S and there's one uh, in Europe. You know, you could think of, you could think of, of a, a, a gas and a brake analogy in a car. If you have two hormones, one could 
um, act like a gas, you could say insulin's acting like a gas to bring your blood sugar down and, and glucagon can act like a brake. So in these dual hormone systems, there's always kind of one foot on the gas and one on the brake mm -hmm. to try to keep the glucose in that so-called targeted range. And we know from their experiments that it does work pretty well. You get uh, less hypo, you get less hypoglycemia, less time below target. And um, you get, you can get less hyperglycemia, which is interesting. You're adding a hormone that somehow raises blood sugar, but you're getting less hyperglycemia. And that's because you can put the foot on the gas a bit stronger. So it, it, it's something that I don't know whether it'll ever come to market because you'd have to wear two infusion sets probably. And you know, one site is itchy enough, let alone two, and the pumps would probably be more expensive. But I think the laboratory studies that that I've seen suggest like I would try it. I would, I would try a double hormone pump for things like active days. And if I was running with real problems with hypoglycemia, what are your thoughts on this? I period? would too. I, and I use that break and gas analogy a lot is what we have now with insulin only is the only way to put the brakes on is to just take your foot off the gas and you could coast a long time before that car comes mm -hmm. to a stop. And that's what happens if you, especially if you're going downhill it can keep going indefinitely. Yeah, so, I've felt, I've felt that myself. You know, you put the brakes on, you take the pump off, and you're still dropping. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think having the gas and the brakes ultimately is going to allow the algorithm to be aggressive enough to manage us tightly. But like you said, you know, it's hard to say what infusing glucagon continuously might do to the body and to yeah. appetite and to the whole endocrine system for that. Matter. Right. There may yep. be other implications. There might. And, and some researchers are thinking about other things to infuse along with insulin. I've been at conferences where they've talked about using um, a GLP-1 or amylin. Or, or amylin. So, you know, I think those of us who are tired of just driving with that gas pedal are wondering if other things could help us uh, mm -hmm. with, with our control. Yeah, the amylin to me is like the power steering. You know, it just makes things a lot easier to navigate. And right. That's we don't a great spike analogy. as much after the meals. Yeah. And then these systems, even if we don't announce a bolus, uh, they can handle the meals a whole lot better. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, glucagon is, like you said, it's it's the alter ego to insulin. It's it's evil right. twin, with, if you will. <laughs> they, they were meant to be produced together, you know, for different, different yeah. situations, but... Our, our body's glucose regulation system really hinges on something that can raise it and something that can lower the glucose. Yeah. Glucagon definitely gives us that. That's right. Is there a uh, take home message you'd like people to, to have when it comes to glucagon? Well, I think my first take home message is that, is that we still have a problem with hypoglycemia, despite all the things that you and I and others are doing with CGM and closed loop and maybe even altering our diets and being really cautious. I think glucagon is, is maybe the new frontier to help nip hypoglycemia further in the bud, but it's, ex it's going to be expensive and it's going to be yet another prescription. And I'm not sure everyone's going to have coverage for it. Um, but I think it's really another way that we're trying to mimic normal physiology. Glucagon is abnormally secreted in type one diabetes and we can now take it uh, as an additional prescription to help normalize our, our glucose control. And, and I guess in the future, we, we might see an indication for it as a hypoprevention hormone rather than just a rescue treatment. Yeah, I think for uh, the exercise situation, so many people complain that they have to eat to for, you know, before they work out. And yeah. I, I don't want to do that. That's, that's the opposite. I'm trying to burn calories. I'm trying to keep myself in good shape. Yeah. What do I want to be eating and eating right before workouts for a lot of people does not comfortable either. Correct. Yeah. You down, you can cramp, things like that. So that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Another option is nice. And you know, that GVOC hypo kit is something that I know it is available in the U S people it's a, have to get a prescription for it. Uh, it's got 20, I think it's got 20 units in the vial. Okay. So that's enough for a few tries, I guess. Yeah. Six or seven, uh, work pre-workout trials, or, yeah. you know, you could be use it for uh, a, a garden variety low. And one we didn't mention is during illness. If somebody is nauseous, not able mm -hmm. to keep food down, 
or not absorbing what they do eat, uh, glucagon is a useful tool. And yeah, I've also seen people accidentally uh, administer the wrong insulin. You know, maybe you've heard of stories with your clients where they've maybe taken a large uh, dose of a rapid acting insulin mm -hmm. analog thinking that it was a basal insulin. Right. And in those situations, you get scared and you don't know whether you should rush yourself to emerge or not. And, and I think it's another use case scenario. I know someone very famous with type one, who's also an educator with type one, and he did this. And if he's done it, accidentally taken a, a large dose of rapid acting insulin for whatever reason. And then he had mini dose glucagon to bail yeah. him out of that mess. We can do all you, do you ever do that, that yourself? I've not done that uh, error myself. I I, uh, I probably would try to eat my way out of that one, but <laughs> yeah, I did it back in college days because I was you know, it was NPH. I was mixing yeah. NPH and regular, yeah, and it was a large dose of NPH, small dose of regular. But I yeah. I flipped them, flipped them. Yeah, I took a huge dose of regular insulin, so I just sat. I I think I just ate a big bag of M and M's all day. I was just constantly going. Uh -huh. It's not the best thing to eat to avoid low no. or treat a low, but yeah. it tasted good enough. So I have one more scenario if I can share my mother-in-law's experience. She uh, was distracted while she was doing a prime on her insulin pump and she was connected mm. to her uh, infusion set. And so she was priming uh, the pump and insulin got in got into her. We don't know how much, but it did. A lot. Yeah. And, and that really was scary. Uh, and it's another case where accidentally you've taken insulin that you didn't <laughs> need to or want to, and you've got now a, a rescue therapy to help treat that. Yeah, you think we're constantly taking these doses of a, a hormone, a drug that can literally kill us if we yeah. overdose enough. That's right. So it just that under, underscores the importance that everyone have glucagon and be yeah. have it available to use uh, if they ever need it. Absolutely. Mike, thank you so much. You're a great source of information and personal experience. It's always good to hear that as well. And as a reminder to all of our listeners, uh, Integrated Diabetes Services is available worldwide to assist people of all ages with all aspects of their glucose management, education, and making good use of all the new tools, technologies, and medications that are available. We have service in both English and Spanish. We've got specialized services involving sports, weight loss, pregnancy and type one and emotional support. Uh, for more information, visit integrateddiabetes.com or you can email us any questions to info at integrateddiabetes.com. Any last words for us, Mike? Well, the only thing is to thank you, Gary, for all the efforts that you've done in our community. It's always a pleasure to spend a, a few minutes chatting with you and, and, sh and sharing some of our successes and failures while living with type one. Good to uh, see you, Thanks, sir. Mike. Uh, beers on me when we meet at the ADA meeting. How's that? Very good. Very good. All right. So on behalf of Think Like a Pancreas, the podcast, I'm Gary Schreiner. Have a great rest of your week.